Welcome to Perceptions Today podcast where we discuss consciousness in all forms. March 2022, episode 16, Keith Robinson joins us to discuss his film Internal Light featuring Anthony Peake. Keith Robinson is a filmmaker under the name of KR Central. As I expected, the, it just this book just blew me away, speak about, you know, the certain conditions that us humans face and kind of question marking what could it be with regards to conditions like, you know, schizophrenia and people seeing things, what we deem hallucinations, what could they really be and stuff. And just the fact that he, you know, puts this bits of research together and comes up, com- sometimes comes up with his own theories as well. Yeah, it just it worked for me. I really resonated with it. So I then decided to buy another Anthony Peake book called The Out of Body Experience. You know, we went into things like near-death experience and stuff. I love stuff like that. So this book blew me away as well. This is an instance of the conversation coming up in the roundtable discussion. Participants knew it was being recorded. Welcome to Perceptions Today Twitter Space Chat number seven. It's the 12th of October, 2021. And today's topic is Anthony Peake's Internal Light with our special guest, the filmmaker Keith Robinson of KR Central Films. And your hosts for today happen to be Central Awareness, also known as Melissa, and M. And as we've always said before, this is actually being recorded. And if you're quite happy with that, just request a option to speak and we will give you that access. But you will be reminded continually throughout the conversation. And it would be nice when somebody else is speaking just to get rid of any feedback or anything, we keep to mute unless we're talking between ourselves and we keep that going. Now, here we go. The summary of tonight's kind of conversation is Keith Robinson will have a chance to introduce himself. I'm starting to hear people giggle already. This is no good. <laughs> and then we go into how he got interested in Anthony Peake, followed by now, Keith, you're letting yourself down by having your speaker. Having your speaker. Yeah. Could you mute yeah, yourself for a minute? Please? For a minute. Me, want to mute myself? Yes, because I'm hearing myself back here now. Do you have headphones or a wired system? Tamara, stop typing. I can hear you. Could you go on to mute, please? Thank you. Now, Keith, are you going to get yourself a set of headphones? I don't want to do this whole interview and talk seriously today because you know what it's like. I need a sign from Keith. Tap a window or something to let me know you're getting a pair of headphones or something. Meanwhile, I would actually recommend following Keith on social media platforms, whether it be YouTube or his Facebook page under the links that he provides on YouTube. He also has K-Central films as well. I'm just waiting to see if everybody's okay before we start going on to letting Keith have his introduction. I am okay. I'm Good, sure I'm Jeffrey. Okay. It's nice to see you turned up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, hello, if, hello. if anyone comes across any technical issues, feel free to send M or myself a direct message, and then that way we can let Paul continue um, hosting. Oh, by the way, everybody could – I forgot to give the guidelines, which is the major thing. I've been laughing so much. Right, Keith, have you got headphones or not correctly? Keith, I know you're unmuted. I know you were going to speak. Keith is having troubles. I think he is. Yeah. I think he's having the Jeffrey yeah. issue where he can't get muted. No, sorry. It's not Jeffrey. Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Right. I can hear you. Okay. Sorry. I think I'm not sure if it's my phone, but it keeps on cutting. So I'm not sure if my phone's slowing down or whatever. And yeah, it just keeps on cutting you out. So yeah, just let me. Do you have. I'm going to go through the guidelines. And then once I finish that, Keith, right, yeah. I can hear myself coming through your phone. So if you could mute that, that'd be great. Am I still coming? Your mute button isn't working. Right. Okay. Do you want to see if we can mute him from? I can try and mute him from. Go on, you on. mute him, Melissa. Oh, no. Go on. Without cutting him off. Excellent. Don't, don't, yeah, boot him out. Right. Because this is Perceptions Today Twitter Space, and these are the guidelines. You may not have heard these before if you're new. My first one is be civil to all and keep on topic if you can. Again, the Twitter space is best used using a phone or a tablet with the app. And again, it's always best to have your headphones charged and also your phone charged. When it comes down to announcements, I'll be using the mute button to address technical issues, questions from the DMs, to ask people what to ask our guests questions. And at times, I'll also use the mute button along with mentioning and promoting other people that are in the account at the time. And also keep us getting, if there's enough hands up, and we want to get back on topic, and there's six questions out there, we'll try and get them all sorted. You will also see the icons below. We tend to use the heart symbols 
in there. And the best one we use is the hand for asking questions. And if you're having technical technical difficulties, whether it's me speaking, which it feels like today after everything else that happened, use the P symbol to show that you've got technical difficulties, 100% that you agree, and also the fist for something else. I just don't know. And um, when you speak for the first time, you can either give it like, say, a 30-second introduction to yourself and also your question or just further information to that piece of topic. And uh, again, if you like this content of the topics that we're discussing leave a comment somewhere on either the account or elsewhere that you find us on any other social platform and again if you want more comedy just seem to turn up and we seem to provide it quite nicely and on that note would keith like to give a little introduction of himself and how he got interested in anthony p i'm going to take that's technical difficulties at this present time hope you're back can you hear us now oh gosh okay <laughs> sorry hello my phone is so slow i do apologize right Okay, um, you've now got the floor. Okay. okay, okay. Hi, my name is Keith Robinson, Birmingham. And what I can say is that I'm a very big Anthony Peake fan to the point where I felt I need to have to make the video that I did without getting to Anthony. I think it was that, that was a time where I started having what you would probably call, you know, a spiritual awakening or kind of like my mind expanding to a different kind of spiritual like that happened. I started losing myself quite bad in life as a probation service officer. and yeah really I just kind of like started slowing down in life and I really didn't know what was going on so anyway forward to around about I'd say about March 2013 I was speaking with a fellow friend who's also a, like a kind of spiritual concept artist and stuff and we were just having a conversation she started talking about time being an illusion it was that something clicked then. I hadn't really gone much into the concept of learning about the pineal gland or the third eye then or anything. It was just kind of like, she said, yeah, time is an illusion, reality, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I don't know why I resonate with um, what she's saying so much, but thought to myself, I, I, I you know, really want to check this out. So when I put time being an illusion to YouTube, I kind of uh, flipped through a couple of videos and I happened to click on one video I think it was called something along the lines of reality is an, an illusion time time space whatever I can't remember what it was but a channel by a woman called I think it's Evita Ochel with the guest speaker being Anthony Peak. and when I listened to it I was just I was just really blown away I had to listen to it more than once I listened to it so much to the point I even downloaded the clip and converted it onto MP3. <laughs> and I became very obsessed with it. And that was the beginning of my obsession with uh, Anthony. I listened to it for 2013. And then sometime in 2013, I would buy normal beat meditation. And I was basically listening to these, these kind of frequencies to do with brainwave entrainment. And I became obsessed with that. As you can tell by now, I've got an obsessive personality. <laughs> so again and again, I'd have my headphones on and just constantly doing binaural beat meditation, like hour after hour after hour, until I felt this like stuffiness in the middle of my head. It's like, you know, what, what is this stuffiness that I'm feeling in the middle of my head? And I started like typing up what these symptoms could be. And that's when I came across you know, things about, you know, the pineal gland in the third eye. And it wasn't long after that until I was constantly lucid dreaming and going out of body and stuff. So it all kind of just like tied into one, really. And listening to Anthony Peak and his research and concepts on that, it just, I just looked so much into his work until it got to the point where I think at that time I'd listened to so many talks. And at the same time, I'd watched a film called Interstellar. And this idea just came along to create an audio piece of Anthony speaking with the interstellar soundtrack in the background because him and Anthony Peake speak about what he speaks about and watching films like Interstellar are both very mind expansive to me and kind of set me free in such a way. So I just came up with this idea of putting both audios on at the same time. And when I did that and combine the two, I clicked my fingers and I was just like, right, I've got it. I'm going to put these two things together. And it just worked. It really worked. At the same time, I added Anthony Peake on Facebook. 
yeah? I thought to myself, what, what else could I do with this, really? Because I've got the audio now, and I've put it together and worked out all the sound levels. So I thought to myself, why don't I just create visual? Well, not create visuals to it, but why don't I find visuals to it, really? And, you know, visuals kind of matching his, his subject. So that's when I decided to download the footage of, you know, DNA and the universe. And yeah, that was it really. And I just put them all together. It really did work. I ended up contacting Anthony Peak on Facebook and I just kind of like told him that I created this video. Yeah. And it was like my kind of gift to him producing such great work that has actually, to me, been actually quite life changing. So now I take it, Keith, that you stopped talking at that point. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. No, no, that's no, okay, because sometimes with the icons, we tend to not know. If oh, okay, that's, okay. you've finished your point. Yeah, that's it, really. Funny enough, I hadn't even, you know, it was it was basically Anthony Peake talk and podcast that I was really into. So this was before I'd read his books. I did buy my first Anthony Peake book at the end of 2016, and that was Opening the Doors of Perception, The Key to Cosmic Awareness which hadn't been out for very long. And yes, as I expected, the, it just this book just blew me away, speak about, you know, the certain conditions that us humans face and kind of question marking what could it be with regards to conditions like, you know, schizophrenia and people seeing things, what we do, hallucinations, what could they really be and stuff. And just the fact that, he, you know, puts this bits of research together and comes up, com- sometimes comes up with his own theories as well. Yeah, it just it worked for me. I really resonated with it. So I then decided to buy another Anthony Peak book called The Out of Body Experience. You know, we went into things like near death experience and stuff. I love stuff like that. So this book blew me away as well. And after that, not so long ago, I bought myself The Infinite Mind Field. And I haven't started reading that yet, but I'm really looking forward to reading that one. I remember I did say, I did tell Anthony Peak. Some time ago, back in 2015, that I was going to make a part two. I was going to make a second video. Um, I haven't really been making videos much since then, but I will be back on creating videos next year, and I will be creating an advanced new peak video next year. Okay. If you're ready, I will go on for the next bit and say some things. So I probably need you on mute at this point to make sure that we don't get any feedback, Keith. Sorry. So... Guys, if you've been in the room before or if you've ever been contacted me, you would have seen that I'd always give out three kind of links. And Keith is one of the first links that I would try and hit you with because it's a very in-depth piece of information which has served me very well for trying to get on an equal level with people to figure out if they are interested or not with consciousness and whether to take a conversation further so that we can both learn from each other. And I have to say uh, and give a good shout out to Anthony Peake for giving me the contact details to Keith. And today, Anthony has been very gracious of actually retweeting information about our talk and the subjects that we're going to be covering today. Again, I'm going to go over a quick brief bio of Anthony Peake. Then after that, as I said, we're going to go into the actual topics. And if we're okay with that, then I will begin. I'm just going to check with people that we can all hear each other. And technical difficulties are out of the way for the time being. Superb, Jeffrey. Good. Centered awareness. We're all good. Centered awareness can't hear us. No, I did. I put on the peace well, sign up. No icon turned up. That's okay. I, put I will the have peace to. Peace sign. Yeah, I'll do it again for you. There the you peace go. sign is technical difficulty. The peace sign is technical difficulty we assigned. But that's not what peace means. <laughs> no, but we don't have a technical difficulty symbol. So that's the one I assigned at the beginning of the podcast. Roll it back. Go listen. Okay. Okay. You're right. Is that better? Are we all sitting comfortably? I shall begin. So. First off, if you want to find out more about Anthony Peake, use his full name, anthonypeake.com, and you will actually be able to go to his website. If we start off in the very early years, in 1966, he was age 12, and by accident, he came across a book called The Sky People by Brinsley Lapeau Trench. Now, this is a fascinating book, which is along the lines of talking about people landing from other planets and coming here. And it's along the lines of Undanakin kind of book. And it got him really interested in these topics. You'll find it was published in 1971. And oddly enough, that the guy who wrote it was an eighth Earl of Clan Carty, which is the seventh Marquis of Houston, which is interesting because he was born in 1911 and died in 1995. And he was a prominent ufologist. And the 
actual titles all relate back to Ireland, where he was an Irish peer, but came from. So from there on in, you find that Anthony Peake gets into John Keel's work, which is Project Trojan Horse, and also falls into Jacques Vallée's Passport to Magonia. Now, I've read the second one, Passport to Magonia, and I would definitely recommend that for people to get into. It's fascinating because it's combinations of seeing how mythology of fairy folk, aliens, spirituality all kind of merge into one. And again, we've always said in this room that language is not descriptive enough, neither is art or sculpture. One day we'll find out with all our senses what actually is the best way to put across what we're feeling and we see because we don't always see the same thing. If anyone knows anything about Anthony, he's actually a voracious reader and wants to know so much information. And he's got a very unique way that his mind works to bring up facts once he's actually read them. It's almost like encyclopedic. Oh, there's a new word I've just created. No laughing in the background, people. Right. So at university, he chose courses that would accommodate his wide interests, which basically specialized in sociology and religion, the theory of language development. And along these lines, he had an interest in Italian Renaissance art. After that, he did a postgraduate course in management. This also brings him into a strange way of dealing with people and figuring out their personalities in greater detail. But it took him away from his calling of being a writer. Then his interest in the esoteric continued for many years, along with fascination with quantum physics and also neurology. Then in 2000, he had the opportunity to take a sabbatical from his business career and decided to use his passion to write a book. It took him a long time to figure out what was going on. It took him a year to actually get a manuscript ready together. Then that manuscript turned into Cheating the Ferryman, which is, again, a fascinating book and will have you turning those pages very quickly. This book covered all his areas of interest, going back to neurology, quantum physics, ancient myths, altered states of consciousness, and the mystery of death. Again, that's always one of our favorite ones that we tend to talk about. But you'll find out that it took five years before his actual work appeared in print. And if you're familiar with Professor Bruce Grayson of the University of Virginia, he actually helped get that book into print by talking to people. And it was because he posted an article of Anthony's Cheating the Ferryman Hypothesis within the winter edition of 2004 in the Journal of Near-Death Studies, which is an academic periodical of the International Association of Near-Death Studies, which is called INDS. So that's I-A-N-D-S. Come early 2005, a British publishing house grabs hold of the manuscript, decides to put it out there, and that's Arcturus. They bought the rights for the book. Then a year later, it was having a substantial rewrite got a new title and they put it out there as is there life after death hyphen the extraordinary science of what happens when we die so that was published he's actually sold over 60,000 copies of that book at present or possibly even more it's been translated into various foreign languages around the world editions which are included are spanish russian polish and i think there's also greek just came out as i was talking to melissa indeed uh, anthony has now had books published in every major European language. He's written eight books, co-authored a ninth book, and co-edited a tenth. So he's been developing the hypothesis throughout these different books and always taking what science applies with standard fact to show his... Because obviously, if you're going to talk to skeptics, you need to have information which actually will hold them tight and bring them in, or they will just hear something and then disappear and run away because that's the kind of case. He also helped write a book about J.B. Priestley, which was in 2018. And in 2019, he actually wrote a sequel to that book. And also, you're going into, as Keith said, about the opening of the doors of perception. Again, a superb book, again, published in 2018. He's done audio books as well for his first book. Now, that's the quick bio of him. And hopefully, some of that information was of use. And you got a feeling for his character. It was really helpful. Thank you. Excellent, Em. Glad to see that we got signs of life and I haven't dropped everyone off into a nice little somber sleep. All right. Okie dokie. Now, Keith, this is where we come into where you've been playing around with the actual 
film footage, we're going to take sections of the actual video. And at any point, please raise your hand and we can discuss certain topics. If you start off watching this, you'll find Anthony Peake starts asking questions to the audience. And he's talking about when you hear that voice in your head, when whether it's actually precognitive in a manner and helping you actually find out what's going on and help you out of bad situations. And he tends to talk that it led him into listening about NDEs and the Pamaronic Life Review. I was going to do experience, but I'm crossing NDEs with everything I'm reading. And as you know, it's one of the moody traits. And he talks about this. And if you were here last week when we were talking NDEs, we went through 17 traits that were actually brought up in another subject from one of the papers that was discussed. So the Panoramic Life Review means from point of birth to your death, that you're suddenly getting imagery and it's like your whole life has been either on a CD-ROM, Netflix or YouTube kind of affair. So at this point, he's thinking, well, if that's the case, where is it all being recorded? Because sometimes he's talking about the fact that when you're having these NDEs, you're kind of feeling like you're either going into the light or floating outside the body, but you're also getting information at the same time. When he's talking about his own memories, he says he can't remember his own childhood in a sequential manner he will start remembering actual feelings of say touching fur but he wouldn't remember as an example he gives of being told when his grandmother died now with the people in the room do you have continuous memory of childhood or do you have those kind of flashes which are called chaotic or charged memories as he uses in the actual video i would say flashes sometimes i can remember things from when i was like six and but other other than that, everything else is forgotten. Is it sensory, though, or is it just being told information? Um, well, no, some of it's sensory. Like, I can remember nine years old, um, things that I was doing at nine, like dancing in the living room. I can remember things like that. I don't think, like, no, because if I speak about something to my mum that I did when I was young, she says, how can you remember that far back? So she can't really remember to even tell us stuff. That we, really, that we did when we were young. So I'd have to say a lot of it would be sensory. Okay, yeah, so that's what the main kind of game is. And if this is a typical thing for most of us, it bears out the point that Anthony Peake was talking about. It's very, very rare flashes, though. Otherwise, oh, yeah. the majority of my childhood is forgotten. But I presume, like the rest of us, if you get either a sensory smell or some other touch, it will actually trigger off some other part of memory which has been laying dormant for a while. Gabe says so. You say so, Melissa. That's good. Now, Keith, can you still hear us? Keith, can you hear us? Can anyone I can, hear? I can still hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Didn't want you disappearing and running away from the first session that you've ever turned up to. No, and no, it's OK. Over. I think it, because my phone's quite slow, what I'm doing is, is that I'm listening to the audio from the laptop. And then as soon as you want me to engage, I'll put the earphones back on and speak through the phone. So... <laughs> Excellent. Good going. Feel free at any time to put your hand up. Okay. Do. He goes on further to talk about more connection with saying you might even have kind of... Keith, put that mute on. You said you're yeah, going to be just good. Putting, yeah, just putting mute on. I have to keep on uh, unlocking my phone again. <laughs> Apologies. Sorry. I'm, I'm really messing up on. No, 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 no. no. Okay. <laughs> you fit right in. You fit right in. We're so serious on this okay. kind of environment. I'm, I'm just muting No one's now. been kicked off. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> I'm going to have nightmares tonight. Anyway, right. So with this, we go into talking about it might even be weather kind of scenarios that you're being triggered and remembering or even just sitting in your pram. And these would be considered super saturated memories. Now, the big question, which is where you now start into hooking in the audience is in case the brain actually records your whole life. How can it be proven and shown to other people? Because, okay, renegade. Uh, okay, uh, what I want to say is that uh, for my childhood, um, I can remember almost everything, almost every single day. But uh, the difficulty is, uh, inside these memories, there's also um, a false memory. So sometimes fantasy got mixed up with reality. I don't know if anyone has this kind of experience. That's excellent. I will definitely be talking to you a lot more. I am very much, as people will know in here, very fascinated how brains work. And Gabe is just giving the 
icons down there saying that he kind of agrees with what you're saying, which is great, Renegade. So it means that we're all in the same environment and looking at the same things. Oh, we got new people, by the way. Paul Headley, uh, you'll find that if you do want to speak, we are actually recording and we have got guidelines, which they were up there, but it's basically civil to everybody. I will be using promotional kind of bits and pieces, maybe mute everyone, but I will be rambling backwards and forwards. And Ren- Renegade? Yeah. So um, about these memories uh, and fantasy mixed together, it's also um, one sp- specific dream. It's always coming back since when I was four or five, something like that. This dream is coming back until yeah today or maybe tomorrow and i don't know if it's special or normal that this happened but i can literally draw out a map of this dream sequence including with the memories that are inside this so yeah i just want to say this as some background info about memory excellent i have to say that it's going to be as i said there are characters in here who are supplying a lot of really great information. And when we have more topics and possibly interviews or roundtables, you're definitely invited back because it's just going to be fascinating with the way that ever the people interact, think, process information. Because a lot of them out there won't actually talk to you about how they process because they want to act like normal people, but there is no actually no normal. You're trying to fit in with a world which is kind of fake in the way that emotions are portrayed on the outside. I think most of us will agree with that. Okay, tomorrow, that's good. Nobody else, it's just you and me tomorrow, and Renegade, we're fine. And Melissa, that's good. I know some of you are at work, and again, I really like the fact that you've taken time out of your day to listen to us when we're doing these things. So Anthony Peake then goes, if we're going to do this, he went into research and he looked up Wilder Graves Penfield. Now, he was born in 1891 on the 26th of January and died in 1976 on the 4th, well, in April on the 5th day. He's an American-Canadian neurosurgeon, and he expanded brain surgery methods and techniques by including mapping the functions of various regions of the brain, such as the cortical homuncus, which is always good to spell, which is H-O-M-U-N-C-U-C-U-S, and also expanding on a variety of topics about hallucinations and illusions plus deja vu and contemplating whether there is scientific evidence for a human soul. The reason why I give you a breakdown of his character, first off, before I talk about Anthony Peake's bit, is so that you know he's basically a driven individual. And now the reason why he's actually driven is that Anthony goes on to tell of Penfield's younger sister actually died due to complications of inoperable epilepsy. This struck him so hard that he wanted to find out a way to help others who had suffered from this condition. People keep sending messages at the moment, so I'm just trying to make sure that we're not lost anyone. While he's doing this, he decides that you can find a way of cutting into the brain and cutting around the area that affects it. And if people are not too familiar with epilepsy, what it is is a storm that starts in the brain, but it also starts in one place, which in neuroscience they call the focus, and spreads out like a forest fire across the brain. I think we've got people that might have either know people who've got epilepsy or have it themselves or anything along those lines or read a lot about it in here. I'm just checking if anybody wants to speak. That's fine. We're all happy. As you know, I always check just to see if we're all going okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can go and listen. That's good. Oh, hi, you're on your face. That's good. I'm just trying to pronounce that correctly on a very small screen. Oni, yes. Is that your name, Oni? Yes. My name is basically Onismas, but it's uh, shortened to Oni. So you can call only. Uh, Thank you very much for doing that, because it would have. Be I would have. <laughs> I wouldn't have gone through those syllables easily. I'd have to repeat it four or five times. <laughs> right. So where we go here is that it traverses the corpus callosum. Now I'm going to describe what that is, but I think a few people out there know what it is. I'm just checking. So what you'll find that between your two hemispheres is a a bridge in a manner, which is a large bundle of more than 200 million myelinated nerve fibers. And the myelinated means it's the equivalent to having insulation on wiring. So that covers it. And it connects the two hemispheres, as I was saying, permitting communication between the left and the right. And sometimes you will find that there are abnormalities. My teeth aren't in today. Abnormalities 
which have been identified in children who have actually been maltreated in their younger days, which is curious to find when I was researching this. Going back to the actual temporal lobe epilepsy, if you're, you have one of these, you actually black out and have a grand mal seizure, which is taken from the French, which means that you actually lose consciousness, but your muscles will actually have violent contractions as well. This is also known as a tonic colonic seizure and is caused by an abnormal electrical activity throughout the brain. As you can imagine, we don't know why it actually produces the electrical stimulation to do that and cause those problems. Now, in the video, at three minutes and seven seconds, he's telling about how Penfield thought that if you could actually stop the storm starting, you could actually localize where it comes from, cut around that area that's causing the problem once you've identified it, to try and stop it. And the way that he was looking at it was... When you've seen forest fire or forestry people fight fires, whereas either put a trench around the area with, if it's a fire, and fill it with water or sand so that it can't actually jump that area of the trench and then cause more fire elsewhere. And this is the principle he was taking for the brain. And again, this is a very extreme way of doing things and very radical surgery. And you have to know what parts of the brain control what or stimulate which. Now, has anybody actually heard about what Penfield did? Because I'm going to launch into that because that's fascinating. Uh, you know, what's going on in the medical industry? Uh, I'm a tech guy. Excellent. And, uh, yesterday, I embarked on some journey into biotech. And then what you're seeing that uh, right now can really make sense. It can really make sense based on there's something called, uh, they call it, Genetic sequence, uh, I think, uh, is what uh, where they can try when they try to find uh, what's going on in the genes of a human person, and uh, they are trying to match and trying to learn the the history of a, of a person based using some genes and with some a bit of an equipment. Uh, in the past, uh, that equipment used to be very expensive. But right now, like, uh, they, are, they are getting there, you know, they are getting there. I know, like, people in overseas, they are getting there. So I would like you to continue for this subject that you are speaking. I'm interested. You caught my attention. Excellent. Um, what we do here is, to make it easy to under, or find out who's asking questions, there's the hand symbol. Because sometimes on the screen, we can't see. And our co-hosts try and keep an eye on what's going on when I'm trying to bring bits and pieces. I have to say, the information only, what you're telling us now, is something brand new to me. I'm not sure if other people have heard this before. But if you're interested, hit the 100% sign on what only just Ted said. I'm glad on you. Yes, good. There's always a delay of about five seconds before people do things. I can now get on to that. So this is where he decided to get onto the surgery bit. He found some patients who had these issues. And what you can do is you can put anesthetic to the scalp of the person and also to the skull. And then you cut a section of that away. And obviously you keep that. You don't throw it away because you're going to put it back later. And he started to put numbers or pieces of paper, I should say, on different sections of the brain. Then he would get a electrode and put it onto the brain and ask the person what you're feeling and also what's it making you do. And he had some really fascinating results. And um, what we see is that at one stage, he does an example of a woman's in the chair, her head's open, puts the electrode down. She suddenly goes, hang on a minute. I'm back in my house 20 years ago and I can hear the people outside talking over the fence and suddenly she hears her young child calling her in her own head. I mean, when she's back there, she's literally transported. All her visual kind of imagery is that. She's literally there. It's not like she's remembering while staring at the wall in front of her. So he then decides, I'll tell you what, I'll distract her from actually remembering this. He takes the electrode off, asks her some of the questions about her son in his current age, then... Without her knowing, he puts the electrode back in the same spot. And then she goes, hang on a minute, what have you done? I'm right back there again. But when he's back there, it's there at the point of the conversation that she'd actually left. So it wasn't like hitting a replay button on, say, a CD video recorder or even Netflix, which he then went on to repeat with multiple other patients. And um, you can imagine that 
the first time you start doing those things to a patient, you're quite scared that you're going to, you know, muck it up if you're going to start carving around little areas that cause the epilepsy. At 4 minutes 14, he then talks about how he worked his way through systematically with the numbers and made sure that he could find on people who had teplobe epilepsy the point that it would cause them issues. You wouldn't believe I can leave them, lose my place now and again. I have these little notes with all little pointers, so I make sure that I know what's going on. Right. Okay. So there's my good point. I should write in better script as well. He became convinced. He had a question. Ah, Oni, continue. Uh, before you continue uh, uh, deep, deep into that, uh, you know, the topic <laughs> is very interesting. Uh, you're talking about somebody who, who kind of like hacking the brain in a way, like uh, what's going on in the brain. But uh, I heard you saying like uh, he removed the cap on, on the head and it puts some uh, electrode or something like that. Are you saying like that? Is it exactly. what uh, kind of like uh, this guy? What is this guy? Einstein. No, is it Einstein? Some, some... This guy is Wil- Wil- Wilfred Penderfield is the guy who did this. I've put links in my Twitter profile with some of the information here. And I don't think you've probably seen the video that we're talking about, which is okay, but I was just going to point you to it. I'm just scrolling down as I talk. And go on. Go on. Yeah, listening. So I'm going to find it for you and give you the links which are worthwhile looking at. I'm going to copy that. Have you followed me at this present time, Oni? Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Just go on. Oh, right no, no, sorry. Me. Have you followed me on Twitter or not? Because then I was just no, scrolling. Right. I did follow you right now. Just right now. Uh, okay, Wait. right. So what I'm doing is Hello. I'm finding icon and trying to find it now. And I can't see it at the moment. But once it comes up, I will sort that out and send it to you. So anyway, sorry for the pauses. So he then decides that when he's actually looking at the brain, he's thinking that memories are formed in, using a metaphor, kind of a holography way, and just interface across the brain. They're not actually located in a specific spot within the brain, saying, you know, just behind the ear, for example. So he's trying to find the engram. And if you're unfamiliar with what an engram is, this is theorized to be where memories are actually stored as a biophysical or a biomechanical change in the brain or other biological tissue. And again, lots of people, he spent his whole life trying to figure out where it was so you could actually go there and access this information. Then you come down to Carl Lashley, who was born in 1890 and died in 1958. We spoke about him in our chat number two when we were discussing the holographic universe. And he spent most of his career trying to locate the location of memories in the brain as well. And he also um, was, well, it's all at kind of the same time that Carl Pribram was also of Georgetown University, was suggesting that memories also worked in a holographic kind of way across the brain and being a whole field, but uh, or possibly even somewhere else, because the body produces an electrical field and no one can really... define what goes in there as some people in the room have been they've actually had accidents where they've actually knocked themselves out of their body and seen other things which they shouldn't be able to see or they've been unconscious in hospital rooms in slight ndes and then picking up information and storing it and again it kind of says that the body's a receiver and consciousness is a signal being picked up by the body and when they were playing around with brain and using electrodes they started to find that there is some kind of location in the temporal lobes, which very close behind the ears and deep inside the brain, which seems to have areas which deal with charged emotions. And they found that fascinating and they were writing about it. And this is kind of a minute six in the video. Now, we then... Paul, are you there? Hello. Hi. Guess who's been talking to no one? I'm going to redo this all again. Not the whole bit, just... Yes. Can you, can you a little bit go back on something you said? You spoke about something uh, that is behind the ears. Uh, can you uh, go just a bit, a little bit on it? Yeah, sure. Where did everybody else hear me drop out from? I literally just missed the last two seconds. It wasn't much. I heard you say the temporal lobes in the brain, deep inside the brain, behind the ears. Excellent. That's good. I don't need to repeat everything. Good. So. 
when they were playing with electrodes and looking just behind the ear of the temporal lobes, they found that inside there is an area which is small but deals a lot with charged emotions. And this just hasn't been explored further because they can't seem to find the information at that point. So then we're going on to Solomon Sharensky, who is a Russian who we talked about before, who remembered everything. And he was born in 1886, died in 1958. Now, because he remembered everything, he found he could actually go around Russia as a memory man. So in the 1920s, that was how he was making his money. But the problem was, with everything he was seeing, it was stimulating all the emotions to things he's seen like it before. So, for example, if he'd seen a teddy bear and somebody had an argument around him at that time, and he saw another teddy bear, a similar design later on in life, those emotions were coming back to him no matter what. And if he saw the same person and they'd had an argument, every time he saw them, all kinds of emotions, whether good or bad, were being replayed. It was complete sensory overload at the time. So when he was getting into it, he wanted to try and figure out what he could do to get rid of it. So he went to go and see Alexander Luria. And he is a Soviet neuropsychologist. And he was born in 1902, but died in 1977. And what he wanted to do was understand the relationship between the physical brain and behavior, along with Oh, here we go. My teeth aren't in. Detrimental psychologist. He was actually known as the top psychologist in Moscow. And when he was explaining his situation to Luria, he tried to find ways to actually remove memories, but they didn't have any success. A number of years, Luria was writing the kind of back history and what was going on with Sharinsky and making it into a book. And this book, again, because of Anthony Peake putting it into this video, I went and found it, and you can find it online. It's called The Mind of a Memonist, basically a man who can remember everything. It's a small book, but it goes on to even explain that even as a child, when he had no language, there was kind of a thread in his head that he could see that when people were talking, it was in different colors being encoded. And when people were angry, it was in, say, bright red colors and other things. So he had emotions, sensory information all being encoded even before he was taught language. And if that's fascinating to anyone, go find the book. Has anyone read the book, by the way, I should ask? I haven't read it at all. That's, uh, is it it's worth the man of mnemonics, no? Minimalist. If you look at the tweets that I've been putting up, you'll find that there is a list of them at this present time. There's a list of books down past the spaces where we had issues with, and some of them are buried in replies to one tweet at the same time. So they're quite easy to find in the last 10 or 15, if you look. Uh, just looking for myself, lo and behold. Yeah, you can see them easily. You'll find one, the first one is Fyodor Diofsky, which then they're kind of under him at that time. Are we all still quite wide awake and enjoying this session so far? Yes. Good. Excellent. Good. Superb. It's always interesting, as I've said before, in many rooms, we don't know what people are doing. They're either at work, can't listen, they're going and putting kids to sleep and other things while doing this. Right. At 7 minutes 38 in the actual video, he's talking about Sharinsky and he talks to Luria and says, I think this has something to do with an illness I had when I was a child. And when he tries to delve into it, nothing's really said there. But when Anthony Peake dives into research, he actually finds a connection to epilepsy, which he found was located and focused on his temporal lobes, which led Anthony Peake into more of a delving into finding a clear link with temporal lobe epilepsy and, again, associating that with memory. Yeah, it's true, but it would be hard to dwell into the mind of uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky to embrace uh, what he had in his mind, you know? Definitely, Jeffrey. Yeah, because it's very complicated. Different political things, political figures in Russia, political mindsets compared to us uh, regarding parapsychology or, you know? Yeah, because we're going to be getting on to him and discussing his temporal lobe epilepsy as well. Renegade? Well, um, about his brain, maybe it's like... Uh... A radio inside the radio there's also nothing stored but yeah if they're gonna uh, play a song for example uh, uh, let me call a song yeah, white, for... rabbit, white rabbit for example this song white rabbit that isn't in the radio but yeah 
the frequency as all the information that can be played in this radio and so translate it yeah, into uh, another vibration, for example, a dance or stuff like that. Oh, definitely. It's still out there whether you're actually connected as a human body to the signal or not. It's still in the ether, for example, as we're saying. But there's also doubles in Dostoevsky's mind, but uh, political doubles and uh, Russian figures, political authority ruling the mindset of the characters in his novels, you know? Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. And again, we're getting down just into that area from the video as we're taking it in sequence, talking about Yeah, because, I mean, the the political sphere takes a lot into the um, double mindset and the conscience of uh, actual in real life, you know. not. So what we go into next is Anthony Peake goes, do you know about Kim Peake? And that's P-E-E-K. Many people know about Kim Peake? Oh, okay. Here comes a small buyer. He's an American, and he had a condition of having temporal lobe epilepsy. And if you remember the film Rain Man, you'll actually see that Dustin Hoffman actually portrayed his character, obviously with exaggeration. One of the things that you found was that he lived in Salt Lake City, and he could forget nothing as well. He was gifted in that way. But when they used to travel around different towns, if he got bored, he'd pick up a telephone directory and look at the telephone numbers down the page. And he would actually add those telephone numbers up and continue throughout the whole book and actually have the correct number, um, as in added up, which I don't know about you. I can't probably do the first 10 on my own unless I've got a piece of paper. What you also found out was that Anthony Peake tells of the way that Kim Peake's brain works. When he was reading books, he could read two books you know, side by side, but he also could read one in a mirror format. So he was reading three books and that information was stored and he could recall that. But unfortunately, with this set of his way his brain was set up, he couldn't actually tie his own shoes, shoelaces, I should say. Otherwise, it'd get a bit confusing if I don't add that bit. Again, Anthony Peake wanted to try and figure out more about this. And he investigated another doctor who set up a exhibition. Now, at 9 minutes 15, he's talking about Dr. Stephen Schachner, which is S-C-H-A-C-H-T-E-R. And again, this exhibit was asking temporal lobe epilepsy patients to paint on canvas what they felt. And he shows in the actual... Well, he shows on stage at the Edinburgh Talk a painting, but in the video it's not there. But he describes what the painting is, that the temporal lobe epilepsy patient feels like there's somebody else in his head. And when they were looking at a lot of these paintings, a lot of them were describing the same kind of feeling, that there is somebody else there and a feeling of duality. So he then starts to point out the links to near-death experiences and thinking that temporal lobe epilepsy and the duality seems to be a feeling that they know the future in ways. And I think some other of you have had that kind of deja vu feeling, even if you haven't got full-blown uh, epilepsy or near-death experiences. And the reason they know this is that... Hello, Jeffrey. Hey, yeah, listening to you. It's very interesting. But uh, go on. Okay, that's very kind of you to say so. I will continue. So what they look at is that prior to having seizures they will actually have this thing called an aura. And the aura could be a case of a feeling of deja vu or just the case of a gut feeling that something's coming. It's difficult for them to put into it. Anthony Peaks at 10 minutes 15 talks about himself and saying that he's a classical migrainer, that he has it to a lesser extent, but it's clearly linked to the neurological fact of what goes on. And he has, with his migraines, what they call scotomas, which is when you have that kind of fizzly light in the eye when you're having a migraine. He doesn't have the full-blown headaches or sensory overload like smell or sound as a problem. Ah, uh, Jeffrey, you and your mute yeah, button. But, You're good? Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about characters in this world, this novel of Dostoevsky and other writers who had those doubles. Um, it's The phone relates to other people and some kind of sphere of a country and a relationship between people. Um, now, Jeffrey, I bet you don't know who we're going to start talking about next. No, no, no clue. I bet you do, Jeffrey. No clue, bet... no clue. Oh, come that. on, come on, Jeffrey. You've been no, mentioning no, his name. No clue. no clue, sorry. You've been mentioning his name. Dostoevsky? Oh, you're bang on track. I'm yeah, glad right. we're there. So right. basically, <laughs> he starts finding out that a lot of fascinating characters throughout history have actually suffered from temporal lobe epilepsy. And great writers have. And I'm going to probably surprise you by telling you 
that some of those people, uh, as a good example, happened to be Fyodor Dioski, who happened to be born in 1821. And died in 1881. Is that you, Jeffrey, with your mic open again? I can tell. <laughs> no. Oh, your, yes, it's you. No. Your big brother, 1984, you know. <laughs> Censor- censorship. <laughs> yeah, that's the way that we work with you. And um, no. basically, he if you look into his novels, and as Jeffrey says, you'll find he's preoccupied with two kind of ideas. One is doppelgangers and doppels within society and within his writings. And his second passion is basically about how time slows down and slowing down and the mysteries of life. Anybody read much of Fyodor Dioski as in Crime and Punishment and a few of the other novels or not? I haven't, but uh, at some point I'm sure we'll get into those. No, but I mean, okay, but it's the great writers, you know, like uh, Honoré de Balzac and um, Léon Tolstoy, for example, but it's it's full of characters, the, the, the different life paths, you know, that correlate, correlate each other and cross each other's but the um not sure what I want to say but but life's okay. full of different people, you know. Yep. Humanity hoax, did you want to say something? I saw your hand up. All I was gonna say was uh, I did philosophy as my um BSC and we studied crime and punishment and it was one of the books that saw my bookshelf and the other day I realised that I don't remember a single item from the book at all. So I put it back on my reading list to flip back through because I can't remember any of it. Admit it was 20 years ago, so age is not really on my side. But uh, yeah, I remember nothing from the book at all, which is strange. I have to say that's impressive. And by the way, people, in the room, I would have to say, go and check out Edgeways. Humanity Hoax is part of Edgeways. And they are a group that do lectures and basically get together. You can have conversations. They have a list of their different topics that are coming up. Mostly they do it on a Saturday night and via Zoom. We had the opportunity of joining in and sampling their topic on lost civilizations, connected up with uh, Atlanta, Skabateki, and also other places. And it was fascinating. The environment is really safe, really nice. People get on well, talking well. And uh, again, there's people in the room that have been there, and they will even say the same thing. If they wanted to say something now before I move on to the next topic, anybody want to endorse Edgeways? Otherwise, it sounds very odd at this point when I just only endorse them. <laughs> you, could, you, could, you could just go on. Yeah. It's um, Saturday night. Early Sunday morning for people on my side of the world. Six o'clock on a Sunday morning. I think it was Jamie, wasn't it? Sorry, I put myself back on mute. Um, yes, it is about that. It was at eight o'clock our time, but in in in, in the future for Australia. Be very great at the moment. I'm kind of just listening. Uh, hang on one, just one second, Edgeways. Edgeways, yes. just one second. Now, if Humanity Hoax puts himself on mute, I'll put myself on mute. Then Edgeways, do yourself a nice, good introduction of what you are. And that will go down nicely, I think. As I said, I'm, I'm outside at the moment, so the audio isn't great. I'm kind of finishing up on the night and um, <laughs> listening to this as I'm finishing up for the evening. So um, sorry about the noise in the background. Um, Edgeways is a... Um, it was a forum that I put together over lockdown um, on the back of a very good friend of mine had said that we should be engines of kindness and community. So I had four, put together a Saturday night gathering for a few friends and that took off. We then found our name, which was Edgeways, and we now put on a free talk every Saturday mm-hmm. night um, at eight o'clock um, on a huge variety of uh, of topics anywhere from what you just mentioned with Jamie this week this week we have um, a very good friend of mine Gemma Honor who is talking about um, transactional analysis and her coaching cards that helps people out of um, the stories that they've found themselves trapped within um we have uh, mediumship and art. We have urban witchcraft coming up. We have talks on um, the mythology and folklore behind mirror magic. It's, it's just a host of different conversations every week. And we all get together and we have a really nice time. Um, you're all welcome to join. Um, so the Twitter handle for me is, uh, what am I on? <laughs> I'm on Edgeways, right? Um, it's Edgeways um, with a... Um, uh, Underscore. 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 
<laughs> so if you if you give us a follow, um, the schedule is up for the rest of the year. You're all welcome to join. It's really lovely to to hear you guys talking tonight. Um, usually it's not a very good time for me, but I saw you guys on and I thought, no, I'll jump in for a listen, and it's absolutely fascinating. So thank you. But I'm gonna go back on mute now and hide myself. That's okay. I'm glad you could actually make it because obviously we are only here if life allows other people to do things. Now, out of the two that put their hands up, I need somebody to tell me who put their hand up between Grey Beard and Oni first because I didn't see. It was Grey Beard. Okay, Grey Beard first, then Oni. No, I'm sorry. I just wanted to back uh, Edgeways. So, you know, being my first uh, Zoom call with them Saturday, with, uh, you know, Paul, when you showed that to me. Um, I just wanted to support them. That, that, that was an excellent show. Uh, very, very community oriented. Um, I felt, you know, being my first show, I felt at home while on that call with them. I mean, you guys called out our names, you said hi, and you welcomed all of our questions. It was very much like this group here, um, you know, which is rare. You know, they've, they've done quite a few different, you know, Twitter, you know, call spaces, and they're just not as welcoming. And uh, I felt the same sense on that Zoom call with Edgeways, and, and I learned a lot. You know, we talked a lot about um, Go Black Tepe, uh, which I've known in the past and researched and knowing Graham Hancock and um, his books, and I actually still learned quite a bit from you guys on that show. So that was excellent, I, and I highly, highly recommend it to everyone. That's great of you to say that as well, and only if you fancy taking the floor. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's my first time uh, uh, hearing uh, what you're speaking right now. And uh, I got so interested, even though like uh, uh, my my angle, I was uh, uh, trying to understand what's going on when somebody had uh, schizophrenia, uh, whereas you're focusing on uh, epilepsy per se. But my side was uh, I wanted to go deeper, but uh, I'll sit back and listen to everything that you say then I'll have that uh, clear understanding uh, because of you. You mentioned something like Ingram, where memories are stored. So I, I would love to know more about uh, that part and the uh, uh, holographic uh, uh, universe that's happening inside the mind. Thank you. I'm glad there's so many new people. And Oni, it's glad to, that you're thirsting for knowledge and you've also got knowledge that you can partake and give to us because we're very much on that and we do actually talk about schizophrenia and other bits and pieces along those lines, as other people will agree. And if you do agree, the 100% sign would be nice to be able to be seen now. Hooray! The delay in the world. Excellent. Right, so what I'm going to go on to now is Anthony Peake tends to talk about that there is a term called Gershwin syndrome. Now that's spelled G-E-R-S-H-W-I-N-D. And basically it's a group of behavior phenomena evident in some people with temporal lobe epilepsy, named after one of the first individuals to categorize the actual symptoms. His name was Norman Gershwin. And he published this in 1973 and 84. It took a long time to actually get the information together. So there is some controversy surrounding whether it is a true, true neuropsychiatric disorder in temporal lobe epilepsy people. But what it tends to do is it causes mild to, and again, I learned a new word when I had to read this. It's called interretical, which means between seizures, some things that I write down and then just go, I can't read that. And it's about the changes in personality, which basically start off slowly, but intensify over a time period, the more that you actually have it. So he goes on to categorize the five, well, there's five clear areas to talk about. The first one is hypergraphia, which is the need and desire to draw or write constantly in some way to just get everything in your mind down or draw these imageries. Then you have hyper-religiosity. Again, if you get that for Scrabble, I think you can get lots of points. What it really means is that they're experiencing something to do with belief, but it gets more and more intense. Or it could even be something not really attached to a religion, but it's such a belief that it starts to interfere with their normal functioning. Then you also find with these people that they typically have an underactive sexuality drive, which is a strange one. And then this is another good word, hard to say. I'm just going to take a run up at this. Circumstantiality reality. No, nope, didn't work. Circumstantial reality, which is the result of so-called non-linear thought patterns. And it occurs when someone's actually talking to you in a conversation, but they keep going all over the place and they're not really making much sense. 
possibly like what we do this evening. And then you actually kind of tie, tie it right back or come right round to your actual conversation, finish it off. And what you will find is the last one is intensified mental. Yeah, an intensified mental life. You're just literally living it on the inside of your mind. You're not portraying it on the outside and you're kind of retreating from the world and everything that's going on. Hopefully those descriptions made a bit of sense. Good. Tomorrow. Thank you. Yes. Good. Good. Excellent. I'm just worrying that we're going to lose the room because of what the previous incidents we've had with the room is. So when I look back and suddenly find we're all still here, it's always great. All right. Not all symptoms have to present to actually say that you've actually got that condition. And again, at 11 minutes 20 in the actual video, he's saying that you'll find a lot of religious leaders have actually got this trait of hyper-religiosity, and they've had it from childhood. And when you look into it, quite a majority of these leading figures in religion that we can see in the West and other places, and if you check out their medical conditions, they've actually got temporal lobe epilepsy, which is fascinating. Then we're going to, uh, Anthony Peake is in contact with many people who have got temporal lobe epilepsy because they've been contacting him through his website. And when they start... To help our research and understanding, leave Perceptions Today's podcast reviews, subscribe to the podcast, along with the other social media accounts and share. Come and join our live events. That way we can get together and have thoughtful discussions along with advancing our understanding of concepts as we go along.